Aha, I'm being Well, welcome everybody to the Montague Barker Lecture Series. Uh, we're starting a new series uh, that will begin today, and it's on creation, climate, and Christianity. Today we have Martin Hodson, Climate Cha uh, Science and Christian S Skepticism. Next week, we'll, on October 11th, will be Rachel Mander, who will be speaking on creation, care, and gospel. On October 18th, we have Kuki Rokum, who will be speaking on issues of climate injustice. On October 25th, um, our own Daniel Button will be speaking on eschatological barriers to creation care. And finally, on November 1st, we have Mark Nam, who will be uh, uh, speaking on eco-theology in East Asian perspective. But today we have Martin Hodson, and Martin's title is Climate Change, Skepticism, and Doomism. Um, Martin uh, Hodson is a plant scientist and environmental biologist, and former principal lecturer and now visiting researcher at Oxford Brookes University. He is also associate member of the Institute of Human Sciences at the University of Oxford. Martin is principal tutor of Christian Rural and Environmental Sciences. He writes and speaks widely on environmental issues. Martin has over 100 publications, mostly in international science journals. His recent books include A Christian Guide to Environmental Issues with Margot Hodson, 2015, second edition, 2021, and Green Reflections, Biblical Inspiration for Sustainable Living, again with Margot Hodson in 2021. And with that, I turn it over to Martin, and we look forward to hearing from you today. Well, thank you very much, Tom. And it's great to be back in OCMS after quite a gap, uh, mostly due to the pandemic, I think. Yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about this whole topic of climate change, uh, skepticism and doomism. Uh, the mouse isn't working now. Oh, yes it is, there we go, right, okay. Um, this is my plan, right, so we're going to start with an update on climate change itself and I think right at the beginning of this series that you're doing on this issue, I think it's good to just look a little bit at the science and what, what's actually happening. Then I'm going to take um, about 15 minutes of questions, assuming there are any, uh, and then we will look at scepticism and doomism uh, and looking also at the Christian uh, aspects of that. And then we'll have another session of questions, and so we should finish around about 3.30, I think. Right, so first, uh, this diagram has become really very popular, both within science and outside of science. Uh, it's the planetary boundaries diagram first sort of thought up by Johan Rockström and colleagues at the Stockholm Resilience Center and in 2009. And then it was updated by Will Steffen and his colleagues in 2015. So this is the 2015 diagram, but it needs an update as you'll see in a minute. Now what these scientists were trying to do was to find what they called a safe operating space for humanity, quite a anthropocentric kind of idea, but that's what they were doing. And so they looked at all of the environmental issues that they could think of, and they said, well, which ones are we already in serious trouble with? Which ones could we be in trouble with? Which ones are we okay on? And which ones haven't got enough data on to tell whether we've got a problem or not? And so in 2015, they um, reckoned that this was the case, that there were four issues that were causing trouble. So we've got biogeochemical flows, which is basically the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, because the carbon cycle is not the only one that's out of kilter. 
particularly things like fertilizers, and that's, that's causing trouble. The second is land system change, and that is basically going from natural habitats to agricultural habitats, and then agricultural habitats to urban development. And then the third is biosphere integrity, and that is essentially biodiversity loss, but biodiversity loss. And then the fourth, not too surprisingly, is climate change. So those are the four issues that they thought of in 2015 that were already causing us quite a lot of concern. So those are the four at the top, and of course we're going to concentrate on climate change in this talk. Um, but the bad news is that in 2022, two more issues are now recognised as way over the safety limits. One is global freshwater use, and the other one is what's called novel entities, which is chemical pollution, plastic, and so on. So, we haven't just got one issue with climate change, which is a problem. We've actually got six issues that are all potentially existential threats for humanity and for everything else. So, um, very serious situation. So I always say that right at the beginning because I don't want people to think climate change is the only problem, because it isn't. Now, I have got a little bookstall over there uh, with some books on, but I'll just highlight one book to you. And this is uh, a, a Christian Guide to Environmental Issues, which as Tom mentioned, the second edition came out last year. And essentially with that book, we look at eight key environmental issues, so climate change, biodiversity loss, water, soil, human population. I do a simple introduction to the science, or hopefully simple, and then my wife Margot, who's a theologian and vicar, she does a biblical reflection on each of the issues. So if you would like some after the, the talk, um, I've got them over there and a few other books as well. It also got taken up by something called the Big Church Read. And so they asked us to do videos for each of the chapters. And so you can use it as a home group or study group type thing. There are 10 videos, but you don't have to do all of them. You could just choose, you know, three or four or when, however many you want, say a Lent course or something like that. Uh, so that's my only advert. To fear not, that's the only one. Right, so now we're going to just concentrate the rest of the time on climate change, because I think that's what we're here for mainly. What's our biggest problem with climate change? Well, the biggest problem is this. And that is our carbon dioxide emissions uh, since really the Industrial Revolution. And it's not the only problem, but the burning of fossil fuels, uh, coal, oil and gas, the most serious of the problems. And so basically we've been piling more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year and you can see this goes back to 1900. You can see it's steadily upwards. There's a little bit of a change in the rate around about 1950. A few little kinks where we have global economic downturns. But the overall trend is up and up and up. If you go in a little bit closer to 1990 up to 2019, you can see that actually uh, it started to level off over the last 10 years or so, the, the amount of carbon dioxide that we've been emitting. Now, what is happening there? Well, if, what's happening is that the rich countries, like the United States and ourselves, have been slowly, that's the dark red, cutting emissions. Nowhere near fast enough, but they have been. Whereas, places like China, and India have been increasing their emissions. Uh, and so you end up with this kind of relatively flat situation. 2020, though, massive cut in emissions because of the pandemic, a 5% cut, the biggest we've ever seen. But now it's back up again to more or less where it was in 2019. 
So um, you can see the situation. We're getting uh, a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Now, there are three things that can happen to that carbon dioxide when it gets into the atmosphere. It can be absorbed by plants. It can be absorbed by the oceans, uh, which is the cause of ocean acidification. And it can accumulate in the atmosphere around us. It happens that so far, about half of the carbon dioxide that's in the uh, that's being emitted by uh, fossil fuel burning is being absorbed by plants and the ocean. And the other half is accumulating in our atmosphere, around about. Now, the pre-industrial concentration of carbon dioxide was 280 parts per million. By the time this graph begins, the famous Mauna Loa Observatory graph from Hawaii, 1960, we can see we're at about 315 parts per million. And then it's going up by two to three parts per million every year. Every year, two to three parts per million. Where are we now? Well, there's a neat website called co2now.org, which I investigate every time I do one of these talks. And we're now at about 417 parts per million. So we've gone from 280 pre-industrial to 417, which is in percentage terms is a lot. Now, if you know a little bit about physics and about the greenhouse effect, you would expect that the temperature would rise. It's been known about for 100 years plus, the greenhouse effect. You'd expect that the temperature would rise with that, that kind of increase. And indeed it has. The temperature has now risen, risen by around about 1.1 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial temperature. Now that doesn't sound a lot. If you raise the temperature in here by 1.1, you probably wouldn't notice it, but actually it's quite a big rise for a relatively short period of time. And you can see what 1.1 is doing already around the world. Uh, and that is very serious. And we're expecting even bigger rises during the rest of this century. So that's what we're facing. A neat way of um, putting this out to the general public is these global warming stripes, which is, uh, was invented by a guy called Ed Hawkins at Reading University. He's a professor of atmospheric physics. And um, he's done them for all sorts of countries, for cities, for different time zones, and so on. And this is the global one going up to 2021. And you can see visually what's been happening. So you can have a tie, you, the ladies can have a dress, you can have a mug, you can have a t-shirt. Reading United Football Club have got it on their sleeves this season, um, somewhat controversially. Uh, but anyway, it shows you very distinctly what has been happening globally with warming. And this is the 10 hottest years on record. 10 hottest years on record. You can see 2021 was the sixth warmest year on record. The hottest were 2020 and 2016. Um, 2010 is, the, all of the years are since 2010. All right. So it's warming up very rapidly. Where's 2022 going to be? It's probably going to be somewhere between the fifth and the seventh. That's the present estimate. Europe will probably be number one. Because as you know, Europe has been really hot. But you have to remember there are other parts of the world other than Europe. And so uh, overall, it looks like it'll be the fifth to the seventh. But I would guess that within the next four or five years, there will be a year that will beat uh, 2020 and 2016. So we are warming up very rapidly. And you will all know, or many of you will know, that actually we hit 40 degrees C for the very first time in the UK this summer. And 
the scientists very rapidly got to analyzing that event. And it's worked out it's extremely unlikely that it would ever have happened without our carbon dioxide emissions and without um, human-induced climate change. They reckon it could have potentially got to 36 degrees, but it couldn't have got to 40 um, without our global warming. And so it's hitting us now and the drought we had. All of that very much linked to climate change. So it's not just abroad, it's here as well. But that's all sort of temperatures, uh, air temperatures, land temperatures. But to my mind, perhaps the biggest problem is the oceans. Because more than 90% of the warming effect goes into the oceans. More than 90% of anthropogenic warming goes into the oceans. And you can see here that since 1990, there has been a steady increase in the amount of heat in the oceans. And it's even getting in to the bottom part of the, uh, of the ocean. So below 700 meters in depth. So it's sinking right down into those very deep oceans. Why is this important? Well, number one, hot water expands. And so it's part of the reason for sea level rise. Right? So um, the other reason being glaciers melting, ice caps on land melting, that sort of thing. So it's part of the reason. Number two, hot water does not hold as much oxygen. So it's bad news for fish. Number three, some organisms like corals, for instance, actually have a very small tolerance range for temperature. Just a point one of a degree C can actually kill the coral, that sort of thing. Um, but the worst of the lot, number four, is that this drives our weather systems. So if you've got more heat in the water, it gives more energy to things like hurricanes, yeah, which we're hearing a lot of at the moment. This is Hurricane Iota. Why do I mention this one? Well, this was from uh, 2020. You will remember that um, hurricanes and tropical storms tend to be named after um, A to Z or A to Z if you're American, right, A to Z. Um, but 2020, being one of the hottest years on record, had a huge number of tropical storms and, and hurricanes in the Atlantic. So they ran out of letters. They got past to Z, and so they started on the Greek alphabet. And I'm sure all of you, being OCMS people, are fluent in Greek. Um, and you can see, we got as far as iota. So we we're all well into the, into the Greek alphabet. But moreover, this hurricane hit Nicaragua the 16th of November, 2020. Category five, the strongest type of hurricane you can get. Now, by the middle of November, the water should have been cooling down, but not enough. And you can see the problem that we're having. And this is a harbinger of what is upcoming, what is likely to happen. Just remember, we had a hurricane hitting Canada just recently, which, you know, what's going on? Really weird stuff. I thought, being as it's OCMS, this is a very relevant graphic for you. Countries most likely to survive climate change. If you're a New Zealander, apologies, somehow they cut the graph. New Zealand off. But the good news is New Zealand's a good place to live at a time of climate change. Now, how do they actually work this out? There are two things that they put into it. Number one is what your natural climate is like. So in this country, we tend to have a not, not too wet, not too dry, not too hot, not too cold on the whole. Um, and so we're good for climate. But obviously, if you're in sub-Saharan Africa, it's already hot and it's already often very dry. And so climate change exacerbates that effect. 
But the second feature is how rich you are. Because if you're rich, you can turn on the air conditioning, you can build seawall defenses, and you can protect yourself against some of the impacts of climate change. If you are poor, you can't. So you can see where the good places are to live at a time of climate change. Uh, and we tend to be, in the UK, one of the top 10 places to live, one of the top 10, because we're rich and because of our climate. But you can see where the bad places are to live at a time of climate change. Uh, a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, the Indian subcontinent, um, Southeast Asia, all of those places are really seriously in trouble. And of course, they're all our brothers and sisters in Christ in those places. And you know, it is very sad, but it's the rich countries like us and the United States that have been largely responsible for the problem with climate change. But it's the poor countries who are getting hit hardest by the problem. You will be aware that there was a big conference called COP26 uh, in Glasgow uh, in November, uh, which is the United Nations Climate Change Conference. And there was a lot that came out of that conference, but I'm going to show you one graph which came out just before. And that's this one, because it shows us what we actually need to do. Right, up the side there is global greenhouse gas emissions in gigatons. And along the bottom is the uh, year. And you can see that in 2020, we were emitting about 55 gigatons equivalent every year globally. Now, um, the Paris Agreement in 2015 said that we should be definitely not going above two degrees C above the pre-industrial temperature, and if possible, keeping to 1.5 degrees C. Remember, we've already had 1.1, so it's not far to 1.5. To get to 1.5, we need to be cutting our emissions from something like 55 to 25 gigatons in eight years by 2030. Not too surprisingly, many scientists are saying that's not likely to happen. But even to get onto the two degrees pathway, we need to be at around about 40 gigatons. Now, before the meeting, governments from around the world were asked to submit their plans, what are called nationally determined contributions. Their plans for cutting carbon emissions. And then the UN put them all together into one bit, one big model. And where are we? Well, we're actually in that red triangle, the NDCs at the top there. And that would lead to something like 2.8 degrees C of warming by the end of this century. And that would be disastrous for humanity and disastrous for the rest of biodiversity living on this planet. So we've got a lot of work to do. We've got to get those emissions down and we've got to get them down fast. There were a lot of IPCC um, government reports coming out in the last year. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a lot of reports. And the last one was what's called the mitigation report, i.e. what are we going to do about it? It's 3,000 pages long. Uh, so really good bedtime reading, but very fortunately, the American um, environmentalist and actually Methodist lay preacher, Bill McKibben, summarized it in one tweet for you. Right, IPCC formula in order, build massive amounts of now cheap sun and wind, so solar and wind energy, electrify everything to run on it, so cars and everything else, conservation and efficiency, insulation, all of that sort of stuff. Research the hell out of the last hard stuff, planes. So how are we going to travel around the world without large carbon emissions? Cement, another big problem. Stop cutting down trees for cows. 
or anything else. Yeah, so you can see that's, the, that's what we've got to do. That's Bill McKibben's idea. I think things are beginning to happen a bit, a bit. Um, Joe Biden wanted a really big bill. He had quite a lot of problems getting it. He hasn't got quite as big a climate change bill as he wanted, um, but it's, it's still a, the biggest climate change bill ever passed anywhere. Uh, and it's really gonna kickstart a whole lot of green technologies and so on in the United States. But Australia, which was an incredibly climate skeptic government, the government changed. They, they brought in a Labour government supported by Greens and independents, and they've now got a really big bill as well. Uh, we need to pray about Brazil. You know, that is the next really big one. Bolsonaro gets back in again. We've got serious problems for the rainforest and for climate change and everything else. So it's a very serious issue. We also need to pray for our own government that they might wake up and start doing some of this. I will end, actually, with this man. This is Michael Mann, uh, and he's now probably the most famous climate scientist in the world. Uh, he's on Twitter a lot, actually. I, um, I follow him, and uh, we have quite a lot of conversations. Um, yeah, he said this. Don't forget, once again, to emphasize that there is both urgency and agency. The climate crisis is very real, but it's not unsolvable, and it's not too late to act. I really like that, urgency and agency. Right, so yeah, it's real, it's big, and we've got to solve it very quickly. Uh, but it's not impossible. It is not impossible to do. We just need the political will and the individual will to do it. So that ends my first bit on time. <laughs> Good, right. Any questions? Sorry, oh, okay. If you're online, go ahead and uh, push on the reaction button and raise hand if you would like to make a question or a comment. Okay. So, here first. Yeah. Any questions? Comment? Uh, okay. Well, wow. you'll qualify because you're from the Philippines. Yeah. <laughs> uh, recently, the Philippines again uh, experienced this uh, very strong typhoon, and we have at least, according to data, 30 plus typhoon every year. Now, the, the church in the Philippines is the natural community of people that if we can organize them and mobilize them because they have a great influence in majority of our people. But what I can see the problem now with the debate happening in my country is we, we, we uh, as, a, as, a, as Christians, we see the data, we see the explanation of scientists, but the way to convince the churches in the Philippines is to, to debate using the biblical text, the biblical data. And sadly, majority of our churches is uh, the, the, the traditional understanding that in the last days, all this will, will be uh, destroyed. And so why would you still make the effort to to restore it. So as a scientist, what, what do you think is the best way to approach this? And as a Christian scientist? That is a good question. It is something that I'll be touching on in the second part of the talk. Um, it's something we've been working on for a long time. Uh, what you have to remember is that this country, you know, I've been working on this for 30 years really hard for the last 20 years. And what you have to remember is that even in this country, nobody in the church was interested in the environment at all um, for 
And it's really only the last five years or so that they've suddenly got interested. So things can change, you know, and yes, I know eschatology is a really serious problem. And actually, Dan, you've got a whole lecture coming from Dan Button on eschatology and environment and that, that sort of thing. It's a very serious problem in some countries. It, it's quite serious in the United States as well. Um, less so in this country, as we'll, we'll discuss. It's, it, it isn't so much of a big issue here. But yeah, um, but things can change. And I know that there are Christians working within the Philippines to try to change that, because there are theologies, and I won't go into them now because Dan will explain it. There are very good theological evangelical positions which, uh, which will say we have to protect this earth. Okay, um, the next person to ask question is Adesi uh, via Zoom. Adesi, can you um, unmute yourself and ask your question from there? Yes, uh, thank you, Daman. My, my question is, you have suggested some solutions, and when we see the, the cost of extreme weather events like floods and droughts, is costing much than uh, investing in mitigation measures like, like the, the list you have mentioned. So is there any, any balance or cost benefit analysis in terms of investing on mitigation measures and also uh, trying to cope up with floods and hurricanes and droughts? Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, what are, what's gonna happen in terms of investment in terms of floods and drought? And actually, the next COP meeting, which is COP27 in Egypt, that is probably the biggest item on the agenda, is how we actually help the poorer countries to adapt to climate change and how are we going to fund that. And of course, there is a serious problem at the moment because, of, because the West and the, the, the rich countries are suffering because of the war in Ukraine and all of those kinds of things and the COVID pandemic. And so then they haven't got as much finance as they thought they might have. But yeah, what, what's gonna happen at that big meeting in Egypt is they're gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of thinking going on there about how we can actually support the poorer countries in this, to adapt to climate change. Uh, thank you. This is a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, is, is there a connection of uh, such a structures to institutions like the World Council of Churches, for example? So, like World Council of Churches. Um, because I'm thinking in a perspective where how uh, ki such kind of measures could reach to the grassroots. I'm looking at structures up to the individual. Uh, <clears throat> because the, the issue of climate is very touching and it's very practical. For example, in my own capacity as an individual, I planted a tree to sit under because like in Juba, it's about 40 degrees or 39 degrees or 43 degrees and we sleep outside and I plant my own tree at trees within the compound and it's an individual initiative but when it is a major agenda or a national agenda for example from the church because the church can move a bigger agenda for example in South Sudan the church is a great player to move to a direction where the, the country needs to go because it has the majority followers but it, if, if it comes through, for example, the World Council of Churches, and then it will come to like African Council of Churches, and then to South Sudan Council of Churches, it becomes a national issue. And then I think there'll be a great participation in which it will make a small contribution. So how is the connection of this aspect in at a, a larger agenda? Because having the World Council of Churches, you already have the UN um, aspect in it, in which it will drive it to the last person at the grassroots level. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it's a good point. Actually, the World Council of Churches have been operating in this area since the 1980s. So they have been putting out statements and things like that going downwards. The, the slight snag is that the World Council of Churches only really affects a certain number of churches and a certain part of the church, world church community. So it doesn't really affect so much the evangelical churches, for instance, which um, our sister from the Philippines will, <laughs> will perhaps know about. You know, the, 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 but what is working with the more evangelical churches is that there is a, now a creation care network within um, the La Lausanne organization. And so Lausanne has a cre creation care section, which is working with the evangelical churches. I know they had a meeting actually in the Philippines with their, you know, try, trying to get leaders on board. So you have to work with all of these organizations. So, you know, I, uh, I am now speaking to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, earlier this year, I, I, I had the first time to speak to a Pentecostal church uh, which I'd never had before. Uh, and you know, that is great. You know, I want to speak to anybody. So, <laughs> but you are dead right. We need it to come from the top down, uh, but we need it from the bottom up as well. Another really exciting thing on the top down is what happened at the Lambeth Conference earlier this year um, for the Anglican Communion. And they had a whole day looking at environment and climate change. And the whole thing has changed. They're far more focused on that now. And they've got this big communion forest uh, project, which they're rolling out across the world. And so, you know, yes, we, we need it top down. We need it bottom up. We need people on the ground to be saying we want this to happen as well as the top down. Very good. Thanks. I was really worried when you uh, gave us the statistics about the impact of the climate change, which will basically be disproportionately be felt, particularly with African and developing countries. And I'm really asking myself, and of course you say um, there are already discussions to try to see how to help these countries adapt to the effects of the climate change. Now, I'm really wondering who is driving this kind of debate and what is the level of involvement of the developing countries who are going to be affected disproportionately in this whole global uh, scenario? <laughs> Maybe putting it the other way, what will be the incentive for the big actors in, who are, according to your presentation, more or less safe when it comes really to, to, to this debate? It's really very, very scaring. And, and to me also it looks like even if we pour our money into Africa and these other developing countries, we're basically dealing with the symptoms. And, and, and dealing with symptoms is, 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 is basically really, to me, not a good solution. So really how do we get to the core of this issue to see that we, we are not just reduced to adapting to the problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. We have got a really serious problem here. Just so you know what did happen in Paris, uh, it was quite interesting because that was where the developing countries and the poorer countries really had an impact because the original target was the two degree C target. So that was the target set in Copenhagen in 2009. But the poor countries, particularly the low-lying ones, um, suffering from sea level rise, they said, if we get two degrees C, we're go all going to be underwater. And so they actually pushed very hard in Paris 
that it should, the target should be one and a half degrees C. And they were actually successful in doing that. So it is possible for the poorer nations to actually have an impact on, the, on these kind of no negotiations. Um, the other point I would say is that, yes, the United States and the United Kingdom and places like that are better off in terms of climate change. You know, so we can do things about it, but we're not immune to it. You know, and, and yes, we're better off now, but in 50 years' time, I don't think, if we keep going the way we currently are, then the United, large parts of the United States and Britain not going to be habitable either. So, you know, it is everybody's problem. It isn't really just Africa, but Africa and the, the poorer nations are the ones who are suffering first from the problem. Yeah. How are we doing? I think maybe I ought to move to my second section. Um, so we're on time at the moment, which is miraculous <laughs> in itself. Right. Thank you for very good questions during the, this session. Hopefully you'll give, have some more for the next bit. Right. So what we're going to look at now is a little bit different. We're going to look at skepticism and what's called doomism. And what I'm going to do is to first of all look at secular skepticism, then at what's called doomism, which you can guess what that is, and then we'll look specifically at Christian skepticism and inaction. And what you need to remember is that very often Christians will take things from one and two uh, and then add a Christian uh, angle to it. So they all meld together into this pot. Uh, but that's the way I've kind of laid it out. So, first of all, Christ, uh, secular climate skepticism. I love the uh, polar bears uh, roasting the, the penguin. On the <laughs> but these are some sort of yeah, amusing little things about, uh, about it. But um, it's a fairly serious problem. Right, okay, what's the summary? What kind of approaches do people take when they are talking about climate skepticism? The first approach, global warming is not happening. That is not, not many people say that now. Even the climate skeptics, very few of them will say that because it's become quite obvious that it is hap happening. Second, it's happening, but it's a natural phenomenon. Every, it, you get that all of the time, but it, even that is decreasing quite a lot because, yeah, a large percentage of it is down to our activity, a natural phenomenon. Only part of global warming is due to humans. The rest is natural. Again, the, this argument is, is more or less extinct now. Global warming is a good thing. You do actually get that um, from some people, particularly carbon dioxide, because carbon dioxide is a nutrient for plants. I'm a plant scientist, so it's used in photosynthesis. So people say it's a good thing. So... But basically, you'll see, too, it's too much of a good thing. So the skeptics have tended, if anything, to kind of disappear from one, two, and three. Uh, but five is a really big one, economics. Yeah, it's definitely due to humans. Yeah, we agree that it's a problem and all of that. But it's too expensive to do anything about it. So let's just keep going as we are. You know, it's too expensive. And then if you do spend money on, uh, spend it on adaptation. You know, don't do anything about mitigation. Don't do anything about cutting carbon dioxide emissions. Yeah, we'll go and help Africa, we'll help the Philippines and places like that to adapt and things like that. But we don't want to cut the carbon emissions, do we? 
Uh, now, who's behind all of that? Who is behind the skeptics and what are their tactics? Who's behind it and what are their tactics? There is no doubt that a lot of the skepticism comes from the petrochemical industry, the fossil fuel industry. There is no doubt about that. They've even admitted it themselves. They have said, most of them have said that they've stopped doing it now but it's very difficult to tell because they put it into dark funds which go around the world without you ever really realizing where it's coming out. Uh, so petrochemical industry, undoubtedly. But often the funding is not direct. So they don't, you don't have Exxon giving money to people directly. It goes through research institutes which they fund uh, for themselves. The funding tends to be for scientists. There are some that are funded by the fossil fuel industry. For journalists, uh, newspapers, for politicians, I say particularly in the States because it is in the States if you're a congressman or whatever, you have to state where your funding comes from. And if you're a Republican, as we were, I was discussing with Damon uh, earlier, um, if you're a Republican, you are almost certainly funded by the fossil fuel industry. And which way are you then going to vote when fossil fuel interests are involved? There are also bloggers, there are some well-known blogs, and then there are what are called bots, which if you're on Twitter, you'll know that if you put up something about climate change or one of the big scientists puts up something, you'll get a whole lot of automated replies coming in bu -bu -bu -bu, to the, with skeptic comments. The same with newspaper articles, places like The Guardian, you see all of these automated replies coming in, that sort of stuff. Often the tactics are not outright denial. They don't say nothing is happening, but they just kind of muddy the water, you know, make it a bit murky. Um, and they attack individuals. The book here, still well worth it, 2010, 12 years old, uh, Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, is the classic on climate skepticism. And there, they were able to show that the people who were behind climate skepticism were the same people who were behind things like um, it's okay for smoking, you don't get cancer from it, that sort of thing. They were the same people. They were the same people who said there was no problem with acid rain. They were the, all of those skeptic type campaigns, they were the, they were the people. And you do have believable sounding scientists or non-scientists making sort of skeptical statements. And that does, does actually happen. Um, there are scientists who, who will be in the pay of these guys. Skeptic institutes, I'll just mention two of them. One is the Global Warming Policy Foundation. This is the big British one, which was founded by Lord Lawson. Um, a long time ago now. And Lawson actually uh, funded it and it's believed that it is funded through the fossil fuel industry. At one point, this, in, the, this institute was sending two emails a week to conservative members of parliament. So uh, they were really quite... Um, influential and so they have had some impact on the Conservative Party. In the United States the big one is called the Heartland Institute and often these institutes are kind of free market institutes so you can see that the Heartland Institute isn't only interested in environment they're into all kinds of fairly right-wing um, economic policy type issues and of course for them climate change is a big one so those are the two two of the big skeptic institutes there's quite a lot more if you search around 
Now, a classic example, a classic example of climate skepticism. How many of you heard of Climate Gate? Mm, no, nobody seems to have heard of Climate Gate. Right, okay. This was hacked emails from the University of East Anglia. Uh, and sometime in the 2000s, we don't know exactly when, the server at the University of East Anglia was hacked and they stole a lot of emails from the Climate Research Unit, the CRU. Over a thousand emails and other documents were stolen, but they just focused on a few emails. Just to, uh, and they looked particularly for two words. One was the word trick, and then there was the phrase hide the decline. And those were picked on uh, because they thought they could make a good story out of them, and they could. Professor Phil Jones up there stood down while the investigation took place. Very sadly, I mean, he was the head of the climate research unit, and sadly, he never really recovered from this whole incident. Uh, he stood down, and then the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee investigated. They reported on it in 2010. And they said that trick appears to be a colloquialism for a neat method handling the data, whereas hide the decline was shorthand for discarding data known to be erroneous. So they got rid of some data, but it was, it was a well-known way of dealing with it. Um, so what they concluded was the House of Commons Committee found no reason in this unfortunate episode to challenge the scientific consensus that global warming is happening and is induced by human activity. Unfortunately, that coming out in November 2009, it was timed deliberately. They probably hacked the computer a year or two before, but they brought it out November 2009 because it was just before the big Copenhagen climate change meeting so that they could cause the maximum damage to the meeting and it did have a big effect. There is actually a good BBC documentary drama called The Trick which you can have a look at uh, which tells you the story very faithfully about how, what actually happened. Um, it's a very, very sad story. And it, for a long time, it really had a big impact on public perception of science and climate science. They released another lot of emails in um, 2010. Another lot, Climate Gate 2.0. And th they actually put it up onto a searchable database up in the sky. So you could search the database. And I thought, I wonder, hmm, I wonder if I appear in the database. And there's me, <laughs> right? Now, how did that happen? Um, what happened is the organization I worked for, the John Ray Initiative, sent an email to Mike Hume, who was a scientist working in the University of East Anglia, who happens to be a Christian, inviting him to a conference that we were speaking at. And you can see there was my wife, Margot, uh, me, Sir John Horton, the famous climate scientist was speaking, uh, Gordon Wenham, who some of you may know as a theologian, he was speaking. So it was uh, a glittering array of people, not, not me, but, <laughs> but, but, but anyway, that, it's interesting how, how you can find this stuff out. But that was what most of the emails were. Most of them were that kind of content. You know, it wasn't actually bad stuff, but, you know, they, they would pick on just a few to get a little bit of information. And then they also do a lot of attacks on climate scientists. This is Sir John Horton, who was my boss for a long time at the John Ray Initiative. 
the famous climate scientist who was the head of the IPCC um, for the first three reports, a very committed evangelical Christian. Most of the attacks on scientists so far have been verbal and written. We have not, I don't know of anybody who's been attacked actually physically yet at any rate. Often what they do is they quote out of context or misquote. So it's out of context or misquoting people. So Sir John was quoted as saying, unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. He never said it. He never actually said it. Um, but the idea was to show that he was an alarmist, you know, that the, that the scientists were alarmists. Um, it became very popular. In 2010, I counted up, there were 134,000 hits on Google, if you put that into Google. I checked the other day, and it's now down to 1,470. So you could still find it. It's still out there. People still quote it to show that scientists are alarmists, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, he never actually said it. And then you get this kind of thing in papers like the Daily Express. The Express. This is Professor Ian Plymer, who is an Australian geologist um, paid by the fossil fuel industry. And supposed leading academic. I think you would actually have to say, doubt that. And he says that climate change is a load of hot air underpinned by fraud. And it's the climate comrades keeping the gravy, tr gravy train going. And what their argument is that the climate scientists make large amounts of money out of all of these grants that they get coming in. I will tell you, I know a lot of climate scientists. I don't know anybody who's really rich. Uh, even Sir John Horton, you know, he was comfortable, but it wasn't, he wasn't really rich. I think actually the fossil fuel executives are somewhat better off than the climate scientists. What happens when you get a grant? What do you get a grant as a scientist? You may get a million pounds for your grant, and you think, and you think, that's a lot of money. But then you've got to hire somebody to do the work for you. You've then got to get mega computer time, or you've got to hire a boat to go to the Arctic or something like that. You've got chemicals, you've got all kinds of stuff that you've got to pay for. You'll be lucky if you get a trip to a conference out of this grant. You really will. But the gravy train, yeah. Uh, but that is a typical argument that they use. But this is still happening. I was talking uh, earlier. This is MIT atmospheric physicist Richard Lindzen, who says that the doubling of CO2 only produces one degree C of warming, and it's ridiculous to demonize a trace gas whose main role is as a fertilizer for plants. What you have to understand is, I'm a plant scientist, yeah, it's a fertilizer for plants. And it, if you have tomato plants in a greenhouse, you turn on carbon dioxide, it will increase their growth. But the effects of the droughts, the floods, the heat waves and all that, more than over, overrides any fertilizing effect. It really does. Uh, but they still sometimes churn this out. Um, and then you still get these kind of statements. This is just a couple of months ago from a group called the Global Climate Intelligence Group. Notice 1,107 signatories. And you think, oh, this looks really significant, doesn't it? But of course, lots of errors of fact. You know, climate science is very poor. Most of the signatories are not climate scientists. They don't know anything about climate. Many of them are not even scientists, so they don't know even basic science. And, of course, many of the signatories have ties to the fossil fuel industry in one way or another. So what is the worth of this sort of, of report? Um, 
but it goes around the internet and it influences some people, I guess. Now, things are changing. We're back to Michael Mann, who I mentioned earlier. If you haven't read it, this is a really good book to read. Uh, the New Climate War by Michael Mann came out last year. <clears throat> and this is what he said. Climate gate, which we discussed a little bit earlier, could in fact be viewed as the opening skirmish in the new climate war. It marked a critical juncture wherein the forces of denial and inaction all but conceded that they no longer had a credible good faith case against the basic scientific evidence. So they would instead deploy new, more nefarious strategies in their efforts to block action on climate change. So what Michael Mann reckons is that all of this skepticism I've talked about so far, yeah, it's still there a bit, but it's not the main tactic of the skeptic lobby now. He goes on to say, the most hardcore contingent, <coughs> the deniers, are as we've seen in the process of going extinct. That's people like Lindsay, they are going extinct. There's still a remnant population of them. But they're being replaced by other breeds of deceivers and dissemblers, namely downplayers, deflectors, dividers, delayers, and doomers. Willing participants in a multi-pronged strategy seeking to deflect blame, divide the public, delay action by promoting alternative solutions that don't solve the problem, or insist that we just simply accept our fate. It's too late to do anything about it anyway, so it may as well keep the oil flowing. Thus, the climate wars have not ended. They've just evolved into a new climate war. So instead of that kind of very skeptical stuff, it's all of these kind of things um, that are happening there. And then we come to doomism. Uh, doomism. I mean, this, of course, does interact with some uh, Christian positions. But if the inactivists have tended to understate the threat from climate change, there is a segment of the climate activist community that not only overstates it, but displays a distinct appetite for all-out doomism betraying climate change not just as a threat that requires urgent response, but essentially a lost cause, a hopeless fight. And of course, Michael Mann argues that these people are just as bad as the skeptics. Because if you think that it's all over, we're all doomed, there's no point in doing anything about it, then you're not going to be changing your lifestyle or trying to get the politicians to change their policies or anything like that, are you? There's a lot of that kind of material out there at the moment. I'll just give you one example. This is Guy McPherson, uh, and he's from Arizona and an ecologist. We are the last individuals of our species on, on Earth. How shall we respond? How shall we act? If industrial civilization is maintained, climate change will cause human extinction in the near term. If industrial civilization falls, sufficient ionization ra radi ionizing radiation will re be released from the world's nuclear power plants to cause human extinction in the near term. In the wake of this horrific conclusion, conservation biologist Guy McPherson proposes that we act with compassion, courage, and creativity. But doing that means that a lot of people are just going to stop taking any action, stop doing anything. And that is really bad news. Now, finally, yep, we're more or less on time. Um, Christian skepticism and inaction, right? As I say, what you have to remember is all of the stuff that I've already told you about will be in your Christian climate skeptic as well, right? Uh, and when I go, you know, I've done hundreds of talks, literally, 
uh, on climate change. And you do get the odd skeptic, <laughs> the odd skeptic uh, in two ways. Um, uh, and they will often have a lot of that what, secular stuff and then meld it into Christian perspectives. I'm going to just look at three. The first two, I think, are more for North America than here. Uh, the other two are definitely here. Um, so, anti-science, eschatology, new age and pagan, and missiology. These are all three, all three are reasons, I think, why we don't take much action. This is Naomi Oreskes again, and this is looking at the relationship between creationism, particularly in the United States, uh, and um, climate change skepticism. And this is what she's, she says. Um, beginning in the early 1980s, the expanding cultural reach of creation science movement brought debates over scientific authority into the national political dialogue. Beginning our story about climate change skepticism in those crucial years of creation science allows us to see more clearly the entanglement of an evangelical identity and the politics of scientific doubt. So what they're arguing is that this whole evolution creation debate that is very big in the United States, not so big in this country, in churches, if the scientists have got it wrong on evolution, then they've probably got it wrong on, uh, on climate change. And of course, they've then also got it wrong on vaccines. You know, so it's the whole of science is, is sort of tarred with one, one sort of brush. That not so much, you don't see that much here in this country, in my opinion, uh, or my experience, but it is a big one in the States. Ah, yes, eschatology. Now, I'm not going to go into big into eschatology because you've got Dan Button. I know he's listening to us here. Dan Button is coming in a couple of weeks' time to tell you all about eschatology and the environment. But I'm just going to give you one example. I worked a lot in Toronto, uh, went to church meetings. One evening in Toronto, this is what happened to me on eschatology. One evening meeting, I got talking with a young man and I happened to mention that back in the UK, I was involved in the Christian environmental movement. This was his response. Jesus is coming back soon and then we will have a new heaven and a new earth. I think our friend from the Philippines knows this one. Um, I, well, I said, I guess if we know the book of Revelation, you'd have to agree with that. You have to agree with it. But then he went on to say, so we don't have to worry about environmental issues. And he ended, I couldn't see the connection, but he followed it up with, in fact, the quicker we mess up the planet, the quicker Jesus will return. You will not find that anywhere in the Bible, but it's out there. It's actually really quite big. Dan will explain totally what's wrong with it in a couple of weeks' time, but it's actually a quite a big thought. Then, I think this is a problem in the UK, more of a problem than the first two. And that is New Age and Pagan Influence. And this is Tony Campolo, which I agree with. Christians have allowed the New Age movement to hijack the environmental movement and make it their own. The result is the minute we start talking about environment, evangelicals say, wait a minute, you sound like a New Ager. You sound like a New Ager. The fact that New Age people have committed themselves to something that really belongs to the church does not mean that the church should not be involved in this. Right, there are really good theologies, which I'm not going to go into because you've got plenty of that coming up in the next few weeks, 
There are really good evangelical theologies which, about care of creation which do not involve getting into the new age and pagan religions. Um, but there is no doubt that that does put off quite a lot of our uh, evangelical brothers and sisters. Uh, I am an evangelical and um, for years and years we've had this and sadly it is in some parts of the church in the UK in particular can't speak so much about other countries but it is a problem here new age and pagan influence uh, and it does put off people but possibly the biggest put off in this country that I've come across is really missiology particularly in evangelical churches I'm kind of guessing that you would know these two guys well um, right so we have uh, Billy Graham and John Stott. They were great friends, but they also had a very different view of where evangelicalism should go. And I, I know you all, you're all experts in this. I'm not an expert in missiology, but you, you will know this kind of thing. They had a very different vision. John Stott, of course, was evangelism and essentially evangelism only no sorry <laughs> billy graham was evangelism <laughs> got it wrong billy graham was evangelism and evangelism only john stott was holistic mission um the only time i ever saw john stott speak was about birds <laughs> he was a great bird watcher he loved birds he, he, but he was very holistic and they had a big argument over this they were very good friends but they really argued about the future of evangelicalism and at their big meeting in uh, Lausanne the first of the Lausanne meetings in 1974 the Lausanne Covenant came out with this we express penitence for having sometimes regarded evangelism and social concern as mutually exclusive now at that time 1974 environment was not mentioned at all in fact it took until the 2010 meeting of the La Lausanne consultation when Sir John Horton Dave Bookless um, Christopher Wright a whole lot of colleagues went to the South Africa meeting and now there is a really big section of the, the Lausanne movement looking at creation care so in the end John Stock has kind of won that argument in a way at least with Lausanne but I can tell you that this when I'm speaking at evangelical churches in this country this is the big one you know our mission is evangelism that's our number one thing we're going to do that the rest of it doesn't count that much uh, so that's yeah final slide conclusion we're on time good <laughs> right right I think you could say yeah ah you can have your question in a sec Let, let's do the let's do the concluding slide and then we'll go to the question right science of climate change stronger than ever I think we agree with that and it is and that and it's now reckoned to be unequivocal we are seeing many of the effects of climate change very clearly now and not just in Africa and the Philippines but here in the UK and in the United States and in Canada um, it's everywhere the skeptic lobby have made a very big attempt to spread confusion and they've been very successful you've got to say They've been very successful in spreading confusion. They have, though, changed tactics. The majority of them have moved to these kind of, you know, other ways of, of doing things. And there are also some very distinctly Christian reasons for climate inaction. And those I've ju just discussed. I think those are four. There are probably others, but, I, but those are the four big ones I've come across. But the problem hasn't gone away. Tom's question. <laughs> I, 
Well, first, thank you, Martin, for an absolutely great presentation. And um, this is kind of a question I've grown up with since I was a boy, because we were members of the California Sierra Club and very much involved in environmental issues. But there are tugs of war within the um, movement with different positions being put forward. So there's not necessarily a uniform view in terms of, especially we're, we're from the mountains. So one of the issues that's come up of late is because of years and years, like in Cal, you're a botanist, so I'm not gonna ask this question. Years and years of logging, you have overgrown forests actually that are tightly bunched and then you have all kinds of what we call slash. So there's been two arguments there. There's been one group that said we should go back because human intervention has created a mess in terms of potential fire danger where things are all piled up. And so to clean it out and to uh, re uh, re restore the canopy so that old growth can return so that fires will not get out of control. You have another side that says don't do anything. Don't even set a foot within the forest. It, the problem is human intervention. And so that just stop it and it will take care of itself. Well, as one who grew up in a valley that just about burned up last year in the uh, campfire and the Dixie fire in the Plumas National Forest, is there one, is there some kind of right and wrong in this as a botanist? It, it, is, is what do you do with these forests that have been badly damaged? Is, is human intervention something that's needed or is it human don't touch it uh, at all? This is a really tricky issue this whole forest issue. There is no doubt <clears throat> that forest management has not been the best in some parts of the world, and it's the same argument is being used in Australia. But at the same time, it is overlain by the, the climate change problem. So I think probably the interventionist approach has got to be the way to do it. We, we have to intervene with this. I, th I think the truth is, even if you just take humans totally out of that picture, say you leave a forest totally blank and you don't go into it, every so often there's going to be a lightning storm where, and it, it will catch fire quite naturally and then you'll, you'll do it. So it's much better that we manage things. And I think, um, I know Margot and I, we, when we're talking about environmental ethics, we're often talking about how we manage things. And actually that the biblical approach is kind of like the stewardship ethic, where we are managing it to make it more fruitful. Um, so I think probably some management is needed, but at the same time, I don't think I would be like I know Donald Trump was trying to blame the whole thing and I'm not sure I'm sure you're not like that but you know that Donald Trump was trying to blame the whole thing on forest management whereas actually there's a big climate change um, uh, effect there as well with the forest fires yeah among different people within the Indian Valley Greenville and that area uh, with not a national argument, but also state. Yeah. But it was interesting, it was mostly what we call people from the valley in San Francisco and LA that stopped, wanted to stop all forest management and they just weren't talking to each other. Mm. And so people in the mountains, especially up the Indian Valley, up in the Plumas National Forest, were very frustrated. And when the fire got going, there was yeah, no yeah. stopping it. I mean, it, it is not simple. And there are a lot of these issues where you, it's not sure which way is the best and where you're going to get people coming at it from very different points of view. Um, yeah, you're right, you know. Yeah, can I make a comment? Um, so, um, Professor Sarah, Sarah Gilbert, who, who her group, you know, make the Oxford, Oxford vaccines, she gave the Dimble B lecture, and the last sentence of her lecture was something like this. If we put our minds together, we can almost achieve anything. Yep. Because, you know, her group created that vaccine in a very short time as well. So, it, it, but it involves a lot of people working together. 
So we've been quite successful in combating against the, that virus using, you know. Yeah. So and, and these climate change things, if we have the, the will and if all people put our minds together, it can be done. It is doable. The, the, the question is whether we can convince ourselves that it can be done. And, and, yeah. and I, 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 I follow the COP26 um, you know, meeting in Glasgow. So the big countries, you know, the big consuming countries, they're still not willing to uh, lower the emission uh, target. Not enough, anyway. And so, so really, we can't wait for the government to agree, and, and then we follow them, because we have agency as individuals. So my, my, my point is, rather than waiting for the, the um, government to agree until the cows come home, it'll be probably too late then, we got to realize that we have human agency as individuals, as local communities. Even if they don't set the target, we, we can set our own target. And we can limit the, 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 the uh, carbon footprint that, that we, we give. And so that if we can get the people's power together and act, that may be a more efficient way. And I just wonder whether there are civil society or NGO who are actually trying to, to, to to, to, to support this kind of people's power. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, two things there. Number one is, when governments decide to act, they can actually do things. So acid rain was a really big problem, you know, in Europe and North America. Yeah. But governments decide, they heard from the scientists that we got a problem with sulfur dioxide pollution. They put scrubbers into the power stations problem is, is not yeah. totally solved, but it's a lot better. The same with um, the ozone hole and CFCs, which were breaking down the ozone and potentially causing a problem. Again, governments took action and they did stuff. Mm. On the whole thing of individual action versus government, it's a big question. And I think, yes, we've got to do lots individually. Sadly, all of the statistics suggest that possibly you can do about 20% of what's needed as individuals. Okay. And the rest you really do need the to be yeah. getting governments on board. Okay. Now, of course, if we actually start taking action ourselves and governments see that everyone is really interested in this and there's votes in it, then they will start to move. So we have to do, we have to do both. But I, yeah. think, you know, I, I wouldn't want to pin everything not on everything. individual action, because I, I don't think we'll get there with just that. Not everything, There's yeah. Question over good, there. good point, thank you. <clears throat> As you can tell from my accent, I'm from the United States, and I'm wondering if you see any points of connection between conservative politicians who are recipients of the funding from oil companies who would also be representative of policy issues that would be uh, valued by evangelicals on the one side and the evangelical kind of disinterest in creation care uh, because it doesn't in their view, value most highly the kind of the soteriological aspect of mission. Are there other connections between the two? Does my question make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it's about the evangelicals in the States. Well, number one thing is there are ways that you can actually say to Republicans, even in Republican states, you know, that environmentally good things can happen. So, for instance, Texas is huge in wind energy and in solar. And it's not because they're interested in climate change or anything like that. It's because it's cheap. It's because it's a lot cheaper than burning oil. So Texas is exporting lots of oil, but, you know, their energy system, their local system is largely based on that. There is a very, well, I think, I wouldn't call it a very strong because it's not very strong compared with 
the forces against it. But there is the evangelical environmental network within the United States that have been working on these issues. Actually, it was kind of helped by Sir John Horton. They had, back in 2002 here, the history is that we had a um, big conference here just down the road in Oxford. And we've invited a whole lot of American evangelical leaders over to the conference. And a lot of them went back convinced that there was, they were going to do something about it. I'm still in touch with a lot of those guys on Facebook and places like that. One of them was Rich Sizek, who you might have heard of, who was the, at the time, he was the um, vice president of the National Association of, of Evangelicals, so a pretty high up guy. And he had, his, in his own words, a green conversion experience here in Oxford. And so they went back and they really got moving. Now they hit, and you can imagine, the Trump era was not good for these guys, to be honest. And a lot of them have got quite disillusioned. But there is a genuine, really quite big movement of evangelicals, and particularly younger evangelicals. We end up speaking quite often here to uh, young American evangelical audiences. And environment is actually really quite big on their agenda. Uh, it's, you know, and I've, I remember one of them saying, we're not like our parents. <laughs> we can see this is a problem. You know, so I think it is, there is, it is moving even there, uh, but there is a lot of opposition. There is a, a you know, there's no doubt there's a, that, that they are heavily outnumbered. Hi, can I, can I just ask a question? I, I, first of all, I just wanted to echo what you were saying about generational is, issues. I think I'm very aware that actually, um, possibly the people in this room are um, a slightly different generation than, than some who feel very passionately about this. Um, I would like to ask a question about how active we as a church should be in making these issues more visible. I was very struck um, when I was in London and I happened to become part of an Extension Rebellion um, protest and I was very moved by speaking with some of them and the passion that they had and I said I do all the usual things, I try to recycle things and the lady said um, you'll, make, you'll not make a difference just being an individual doing those things you need to bring about change and the reason why we're here is we want to be radical about change. And my question to you is, are we as a church being radical enough about change? Now that is a very good question. Are we as a church being radical enough about it? And what about young people? Well, of course, you've got Rachel Manda coming very shortly. And she's the absolute expert on this because she's been running basically the, the pilgrimage to Glasgow. She was the, the chief person running it for all of these young people uh, doing it. The, very recently, Tear Fund did a survey of churches, um, of young people in churches, and basically their number one issue was environment and climate change. It really was. It was the number one issue and what did they hardly ever hear of in their churches? Environment and climate change. Now I have to say that I think the survey could have been slightly biased towards the really big evangelical churches, which have always been the most difficult for us to get into. I mean, I will go anywhere, you know, as I say, I, I will go absolutely anywhere. I'll go Pentecostals, I'll go, I'll go to liberal Catholics, I'll go to Catholics, I'll go anywhere to speak. Um, I don't have any particular biases in that direction. But undoubtedly, from my personal experience and speaking as an evangelical, the evangelical churches have been the most difficult to get into. They're also the ones that have got most of the young people at the moment, or the majority of young people are in, in those sort of churches. And so, yeah, I mean, we've got to be a lot more radical and we've actually got to address these issues in our churches. You know, we can't just be putting it out there. 
And the worst thing is what I call the token thing. You know, where they'll get somebody like me to turn up, uh, do a sermon for them, and then they tick the box on environment and, well, well, we'll come back to that in three years' time. You know, that sort of thing. That doesn't work. And it is crucial for the future, not just for the future of the planet, but the future of the church, that we actually really do address these issues because the young people are not going to be interested if, if we don't. They're really not. I've been preaching, haven't I? <laughs> Got into preaching mode there. <laughs> Thank you, Martin, for just an excellent, let's put our hands together. And it's a good point to put a pause on as well, because next week is Rachel Mander. All right, so we'll have Rachel here and talk about um, creation, care, and the gospel. So so we have a great uh, the, uh, lecture next week. And um, the one thing is this, you know, OCMS has always been about holistic transformation. So this is, this is a good place to preach it. So and preach it when we get home. And especially in terms of nations and representative of nations that are gonna be most uh, uh, impacted by climate change. And we can see that already. And we're praying for, even right now in our chapels, for the people in North Africa that are literally starving to death because of the drought. And they're watching their animals, animals being slaughtered and they will have no food to feed their children and grandchildren. So. This is something that is very serious and that we need to take for. But thank you for sharing with us, Mark, today. So with that, adieu. And if you're interested in a book, I've got some over there. <laughs>